So we'll call the meeting to order um, 4.30. And I thought maybe we'll just do a quick roll call. I know everybody's here, but just so Joanne has it. Um, um, I, I think everyone's here. So Megan, Dale, Chris, Bryden, Susie, Thomas, me, Rhea, Callie. And uh, so it looks like it's great. Full house. Terrific. Um, and Joanne mentioned there isn't any, there's no public to be heard tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. So I guess um, I would like to start with approval of the minutes. So if somebody has uh, would make a motion. Um, I move to approve. Great. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Bryden? I'm oh, sorry, I'll second. Thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye, please. Wave your hand. Aye. Right. Opposed? <laughs> okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. And um, I guess we're, this might be the shortest meeting on record. Um, Eric, do you want to tell us about the accessions? We'll do that next. All right. Um, so we have three accessions today. The first one is another in our uh, uh, COVID-19 collection. Uh, this came comes from the Public Safety Department of the city. Um, and a couple of photographs from early in the days of COVID when they were actually kind of showing people what someone wearing PPE would look like. And then uh, the one in the middle is actually a photo that the police took as a thank you to Long Tucky Distillery. They were making um, hand sanitizer uh, for the city early on. So that is uh, uh, the three digital photos that uh, we're proposing from that collection. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are the vials, the first vials used for um, vaccinating people in Longmont, uh, both from Longs Peak Hospital out on the east side of town and from Longmont United Hospital on Mountain View Avenue. Um, and um, uh, both of them, uh, the uh, Longs Peak one looks a little different because they actually totally cleaned it out. Interestingly enough, Longmont United, there's a tiny amount of vaccine left inside. When I first saw it, I was a little freaked out. I was like, oh my God, they gave us a full vial. And then I realized, no, it, it's actually just a tiny drop up in the, up in the neck. So um, anyway, those, um, those were things that we uh, uh, reached out to them and they were very pleased to do that. So any questions on any of those uh, proposed accessions? I don't, I don't have a question. I just want to make sure that everybody understands um, kind of what went into this. Eric really took the lead in um, trying to think about objects that would represent this moment in time. And so he deserves a lot of credit for reaching out to the hospitals to try to um, get this so that we, I mean, this is a historic moment and um, trying to understand how we document that is a little um, ambiguous at this time. And I, I just wanna make sure that we give a lot of credit to Eric to um, for understanding how to, how we might figure this out. So everybody needs to know that. Thanks, Kim. Well, along that same line, Eric, what uh, do you have like a kind of a bucket list for of things that you're thinking would be good for us to to collect at this point, or as we kind of go through this? Um, so some of the things that that have come up as possible things to collect. Um, one is related to the Calwood fire, since it was so close to Longmont. Whether there is um, some debris, you know, a melted bicycle or something that the museum might want to acquire. Um, I haven't had as much success. I, again, asked, put out some feelers and haven't, haven't gotten any responses. So, um, but uh, definitely, if you know of anybody who was 
affected who might have something like that. That's um, uh, something we would be interested in. Um, still definitely want to collect uh, masks and some things like that. It's just, we sort of feel like people are still using them. Um, and um, I think really anything that, that relates to either the response to COVID um, or uh, also any of the other uh, events over 2020. There's really a lot that has happened in 2020. And, and um, so we are still, I think, processing a lot of that. I know uh, the Smithsonian has done a ton of collecting from protests and so forth, as has History Colorado. And, you know, we haven't had that level of protest in, in Longmont, but um, uh, certainly those are, are areas that I think people um, approached us with items from any of the, the protests that have occurred, we would, would definitely consider that as well. Thank you. Okay, um, so is there a motion to um, approve the proposed accessions? I move we approve the proposed accessions as presented. Thank you, Dale. Is there a second? I have a second. Thank you, Tom. All in favor of accepting the proposed accessions as presented? Raise your hand. Very good, thank you. All opposed? That's a unanimous vote in favor, thank you. Um, Kim, would you like to give the director's report, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, again, I think you guys all got this in your packet. Um, I think I will go over most of it tonight, um, but again, if you've got questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. I'm looking in this direction, so you might have to um, say something out loud so that I can you can get my attention. Um, so starting with the, the first bullet point there, you know, we've gone back and forth um, in terms of being closed and being open and what, what category we fall into and all of these things. So um, I, if you recall from the last time we met, we had the basically the state had created a new category that included museums that was educational institutions. And so we were able to reopen under that. Um, and then uh, since then, the, um, the DAOs moved to orange, which in practical application didn't change that much about what we were doing because we were able to open under red under this new category. Um, the Basically what the difference is, is um, the caps. So you easy, either use a calculator for the amount of space that you have, or there's the cap. And so because of our spaces, those numbers didn't change very much at all. So um, so this move to orange, in fact, didn't do very much for the museum at all. It did change um, staffing uh, levels in the museum, um, but really other than that, it didn't change anything. So, but just so you know, um, it, it moved to orange. And as far as I understand, it's still in orange. Luckily, the other thing that we have experienced, and I think probably you know, is that um, there was an expectation that we would see a rise in cases um, after the New Year's holiday and people getting together. And I don't think that we have seen that bump. And here we are, the 20th of the month, and I and we still haven't seen that bump. So um, we're still hopeful that that isn't gonna happen and we'll still start seeing decline in, in case numbers. So that's really good for us. Um, go down then to the marketing membership and development portion of the, of the report. Um, we got an additional donation from the Stewart Family F Foundation for $100,000. You may recall that we got $100,000 earlier in the year. And then I think last year we got about $80,000 after Lila had passed away. So cumulatively after Lila's death, we've received um, $280,000 from the Stewart Family Foundation. Um, and we're likely to receive even more from them. This was, um, uh, talked about early in the, this additional hundred thousand dollars was talked about um, in terms of matching some of our um, uh, fundraising efforts. So the um, 
webathon that we had at the end of the year, our annual campaign, those kinds of fundraising activities, they were going to match for us. And ultimately um, what they ended up doing, which was really very lovely is that in we, uh, I'm not gonna remember the number off the top of my head, but um, we didn't bring in $100,000 and yet they gave us $100,000. Um, so that was a very, very generous additional donation that they gave. Just FYI for you guys, um, that lives, that money lives in the Friends account. So um, you're aware that we have the Friends of the Longmont Museum. And so uh, the $200,000 that we received from them actually lives in their bank accounts at this point. And the reason that we did it that way is that we want to be really strategic about how we realize revenue because it, it impacts our SCFD uh, um, threshold for revenue for tier two. So putting it in the friends fund actually gives us the ability to kind of um, make sure that we are in a well positioned to reach the threshold every year for, for tier two. Um, so just so you know that, that that's where that money lives. Um, the annual campaign was actually seriously successful this year. We brought in more money than we ever have for that annual campaign at 15360 um, So far, we've received $157,000 um, from the SCFD Tier 2 revenue, and we still have one more um, distribution that we'll see in March of this year. Um, so that represents the calendar year of distributions. So they had originally estimated $125,000 and that was based on, and I know I've said this a million times, but just to reiterate, that was based on a 30% reduction of the SCFD um, revenue that they received from taxes. And so what we're seeing is that that 30% reduction in their estimates was way low. They're seeing something more like two and a half or 3% of a reduction in the tax revenue that they're getting. Um, and so that's why we see even now a, even more money than they had estimated. Um, so at $157,000, um, I, I don't know what the final distribution will end up being because that's going to be on based on actual t um, tax revenue, um, but but it will be significantly more than what they had estimated originally, which is very, very positive news. We also submitted an application for the Colorado Arts Relief Funds. Um, this is uh, a state funds that were dedicated for arts institutions um, to try to help people who are really suffering. And the reality of that is that they are targeting with this these relief funds, they are really target, targeting organizations that are on the verge of closing. Um, we have been very, very lucky throughout this in that we have city support. There are a lot of um, nonprofit organizations and arts organizations that aren't faring so well at all. Um, so I don't have a lot of optimism that we're going to get any money from this art relief fund, um, but I submitted an application. Um, so perhaps we will see a little bit of money from that. So I'll let you know if that happens. And I'll just add my own personal opinion about this. Like this money really does need to go to organizations that are seriously at risk. And so if that's what happens, I will not be disappointed. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We've got the newsletter that was just released today. Um, so many of you have probably seen that in your inbox. Um, again, we've got some amazing programs that we have developed in this weird moment in time. I'm um, forever indebted to the staff for being able to stay creative and responsive and they continue to do online programming. I think that what we're seeing with a lot of the, um, you know, the vaccines and the projections about how long we're going to be in this um, weird moment, it just makes sense for us to continue doing online programming. And so we've done a lot of that. We are open. So we, well, as soon as the um, exhibit opens, we're open. Um, but that really is just going to be for exhibits. It's not going to be for um, programming and that sort of thing. So auditorium events are going to be um, online and our classes and things like that will remain online. And I think that that remains prudent at this point in time. And as things open up and as people get healthy and all of that, then we'll be responsive. Go ahead, let Eve. I just had one quick question. I did look at that newsletter. 
Um, and I noticed that like the art and sip and, and concerts and all that kind of stuff, they were all free. And I wondered, um, is it just too much overhead to try to um, restrict it to only to ticketed people? Is that one of the reasons or just? Well, there's a couple of different things that um, we've been playing with. So one specifically with art and sip, we did try to charge for that at some point and we got no registrations whatsoever. And then, so we started to do, you know, like a little bit. And so we've, we've played with it to see kind of where people are willing to spend money and where they aren't. Um, and ultimately where we landed is that um, for a lot of those programs, what we're going to end up doing is it, it'll be in-house. So we aren't going to be hiring contractors for them, which means it reduces our expenses. And so the, the staff will be um, conducting those classes and that gives us a little bit more flexibility to be able to offer them for free. Um, and, and that's what we've, like I said, experimented with is that they, they, the numbers are drastic in terms of um, people who are signing up for them, free versus paying for them. And so um, what we've decided is that we'll just monitor those expenses and still be able to offer some programs for our um, constituents. Um, and so it's been difficult to monetize those things. Um, some people have been successful at it. I know um, uh, Swallow Hill, for instance, is um, having uh, concerts that people pay for. Um, I think that we've tried to hit a note where we are balancing a line of, of being able to offer things to the community and balancing that with the expenses that we have. Great, thank you. I just was was curious because I know I've, uh, for other uh, institutions I've seen, you know, a mix, and uh, you know I know some of the things, some of the presentations are not in house. You know, I know Art and Sip is, but some of the other things, obviously, I assume that the museum is paying for. Right, and and part of that is that we really are trying to um, be at least revenue neutral. And so if we are, if, if something costs more than we're bringing in, we try to bring in sponsorship dollars. And so what we're trying to do is maintain that at least breaking even um, and whether that's revenue that's coming in or whether that's some kind of sponsorship, we're just trying to be as, as responsible as we possibly can with those dollars. Cool, thank you. Okay, is that, does anybody else have questions about that? Okay. No, I was just going to say that that's what I'm finding with a lot of the Denver museums also, because we're members of pretty much all the museums in Denver. And most of them have free events, if you're a member. Yeah, it is. it is. It's been really difficult for us to be able to monetize the online programs. Um, and and I think that what where we've arrived as a, as a staff is that... We could we could see our attendance drop off if we start to charge more, or we could provide things for free and just watch our expenses. And so we've really tried to balance that so that we are able to offer programs for folks. Thanks so much, Chris, for offering that too. Uh, let's see, where was I? Was there something else? Sorry. Okay. I'll continue. Um, let's see, we're beginning the work on promoting some of the, the events that are listed in that newsletter. So there's a lot of um, promotion that's going on through Facebook and community calendars and that sort of thing. We've also are finalizing some of the advertising for um, the upcoming um, Enduring Impressions exhibition that opens on January the 29th. Um, and we're very, very excited about this show. So um, everybody should tune in for the virtual opening reception and come to the museum to see that ex exhibit. It's gonna be very cool. In the education department, so these are some fun numbers. Um, we've distributed 92 Discovery Days art supply kits to families in need um, the week before Christmas at um, the food and grocery distribution sites. Um, and we included tons of great art supplies and Discovery Day scholarship information. Um, you may recall that the um, Dodge family has supplied some um, funds uh, to be able to provide scholarships for folks um, for uh, some of the programs that we offer. 
And also included in that were resources about how to get free internet, um, some psychological support and rental assistance. So we really tried to provide a lot of information for folks in this bizarre time that we're living through and, you know, really try to be a resource for folks um, in all the different sort of fingers that we do. Um, January Discovery Days enrollment is increasing um, to 55 for the month, and we've we uh, anticipate a jump um, back to 80 or more in February. That's been a really, really successful program. So, um, I, again, going back to what you were asking about, Eve, I think that um, through this, we're experimenting a little bit, and we're trying to see where people are, are gravitating. Um, and so Discovery Days is one of those places where we're seeing a lot of, of really good um, response. We continue to offer outreach reach kits uh, through the season. The week of January 11th, we install, deinstalled Day of the Dead. So that was last week, whatever that was. Um, so that is gone. And we're now in the process of doing the installation for the Impressionist exhibition. Um, we are meeting with the Innovation Center. So this was a partnership that we established now a couple of years ago. Um, and we're continuing to work through it. Um, coronavirus totally threw a monkey wrench in a lot of these plans, but we are, are um, still trying to move it forward. And so um, there are going to be some uh, field trips that are uh, established through that program. And then we're also working with them on the mobile lab collaboration. Um, and a lot of what they are working through with that prog project is um, telling hard histories. And so essentially the curriculum that they're developing for the mobile lab for the St. Brain School District um, is going to be really challenging stuff. But I think things that will be um, ways that people are... Um, the, the students will be able to learn about history in a really different way. And so for instance, one of the things that we've been talking about is the Amachi inter internment camp. Um, and so they're doing it in, in inventive ways. They're doing a graphic novel. Um, and so being able to kind of uh, take, take new methodologies and look at these um, uh, difficult histories I think engages the students in a way that they can really kind of understand it in a, in a visceral kind of way. So those projects are going forward. It's a little bit slow, but we're working on it. Um, we've also had, as you guys know, I think that we got a, a grant from the Colorado Historical Records Advisory Board that allowed us to do um, some digitizing. So Rocky Mountain Audiovisual Productions um, did digitized 45 um, videotapes from Channel 8. Um, and these go back to the 1980s. And some of them are funny and cool and a little silly. And Eric, I don't know if you want to chime in on some of these. Yeah, we've got some 1980s. There was a brief time when Longmont had a cable news program and and the anchors are totally like out of the 80s, the big hair and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty interesting to, to see some of those. And then there's some others that are, you know, some great oral histories that were done in the late 80s, early 90s of, of people who are now, you know, long gone, but uh, really some great resources. So this is a, I mean, just again, for, because you guys are all interested in stuff, I'll, I'll expand just a little bit, you know, um, digital media and preserving digital media is really a, um, a kind of um, a topic that's on the forefront for archivists. It changes like daily, you know, like what's the best, me best methodology and um, how do you preserve these things the best and do you constantly change the format and so on and so forth. So Eric has done a great job in really staying on top of um, what's happening in the field to understand what the best sort of preservation methods are. So I give him a lot of props for not just writing the grant, but um, being able to get some of these things digitized for, for future folks. And who knows, we may turn them into another format into the future, but we're doing the best that we can to make sure that these are in a format that will be enduring, if you will. Um, Eileen, who's um, the registrar at the museum, continues to make um, all kinds of insurance and shipping arrangements for enduring um, impressions. Um, those uh, works of art showed up at the museum yesterday. 
Um, and so she was at the uh, collector's apartment collecting those things. Um, and so they are on site and being um, hung on the walls as we speak, basically. Um, we've also, as, as uh, Erica already mentioned, we've um, been um, doing some work to acquire the COVID vaccine. Um, vials, and I'm sure Eric will work on other um, ideas about how we collect that material culture. Um, he also wrote a grant um, to get a UV light meter, and so we'll be um, using that to be able to monitor the lighting in our gallery. And again, just because I know you guys are all interested in this, um, that's a really important thing for museums because yeah. light is a, it can damage artwork and especially artwork that has um, that's on uh, works on paper. And so um, having this light meter helps us a lot to try to understand um, the amount of light that we are able to expose different works of art to or different um, archival materials to. Um, so that we are doing the best that we can to preserve those things. So this light meter is actually a really good tool for that. In terms of our exhibitions, um, we've been doing a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things that um, the exhibitions department has done recently is that with um, some upgrades that have happening that have happened over at the Civic Center, we have reframed all of the city mayor's um, photographs. Um, and those will be installed. I think they were installed last week, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, you know, some fun other duties as a sign happen um, for us. Um, then we're also waiting on inks. We got a new uh, uh, plotter for the exhibitions department. And so we're waiting on the inks for that to arrive so that we can use that to its full um, potential. Um, we, they have also worked a lot with helping with the discovery days, the, ex the exhibitions department. I have to say like everybody has just pitched in on everything that we've been doing lately. So as we go through this, you'll see a lot of cross collaboration. So um, building those discovery day kits and also the day of the dead kits was a lot of work. Um, and so everybody kind of pitched in to make those things happen. Um, Let's see, we've got the um, Impressionism exhibition that's going on. There will be a catalog for that exhibition. And so we should be seeing that in the museum soon. It's gonna be a beautiful publication. Um, we're finishing up the design. There's also, um, in addition to the um, exhibition with the um, uh, Impressionist work, um, that little portal gallery is also going to include um, a, a didactic about how to make lithographs. And so we borrowed some um, pieces from the CSU um, printmaking department in order to be able to tell that story well. And so that's gonna be in that sort of portal gallery where we're, we'll tell you know basically how lithographs are made. Um, so that's gonna be happening. We do, as you might expect, um, we have uh, this is a relatively expensive exhibition. The value of the artwork is high. And so we're gonna be contracting with Trident Security. And we've also um, worked with the Longmont's uh, Public Safety to be able to have a little bit extra security for this exhibition. So we're feeling really good in terms of our cameras and in terms of the coverage that we're gonna have. Um, and so we're, we've got the security kind of um, protocols really nailed down. So we're very excited about that. Um, the public safety has been very, very helpful with us for that. They, they helped us um, kind of develop a, a protocol for the areas that were weak and what we needed to pay attention to. So they've been really helpful. And then in the spring of 2023, we've got um, a spot that we are considering a contemporary Native American art exhibition. So we're gonna be working on that in the future. We've got um, a consultant that is helping us with that. And so that's probably gonna be, we, you'll see more about that coming up. Um, in terms of auditorium and special events and rentals, that's the next section on your report there, um, 2020 by the numbers. So this is gonna give you just a, a brief snapshot of what happened in the auditorium this year. There were 37, uh, last year, sorry. There were 30, 37 programs, that 28 of them were virtual. There were 171 um, program participants, including performers, panelists, speakers, that sort of thing. That's a lot of people to try to manage, just FYI. 
There were 2,500 plus minutes of live stream video, 40,000 plus views, um, including Facebook, Longmont Public Media, and YouTube, and over a thousand minutes of video that was viewed. So we really did an amazing job of translating what we did in the auditorium to an online format. And I am in intensely grateful for um, the staff that worked on that. There was, it was a lot of work to kind of um, get ourselves up to speed. And I think they did an amazing job to be able to do that. Um, we did get um, through the uh, city manager's office and the CARES dollars that they received, we got some technology upgrades in the auditorium. And so you can see some of the details there in terms of video and sound. Um, but basically what that allows us to do is that we can live stream in a much more streamlined way. Um, we've been, we have contracted with Longmont Public Media to be able to bring some of those things. There's a city contract um, that they have uh, uh, been able to help us live stream those things. Um, and so basically what this allows us to do is that they don't have to bring their own equipment in, that we've got this um, equipment already in the auditorium um, and that we'll, we will be able to use that equipment forever. It's gonna be a really wonderful thing to be able to have that space outfitted with that equipment. So we're, we're so happy and, and grateful for the city manager's office to that. Some of you probably participated in the Webathon. Um, and so that was actually a really very fun event. And we raised about $6,600 or so. Um, and so again, that was matched um, by that $100,000 donation from the Stewart Family Foundation. Um, we did, uh, we will be doing with a virtual um, opening reception coming up on the 28th. Um, for the Impressionist exhibit. Um, we're going to have our guest curator, Simon Zalkin, there. Um, we've got a, a pre-filmed um, um, interview with the donors, the um, collectors, um, doctors, and Mr. Mower. Um, and so that'll be on the opening reception. Um, and then we're going to have live piano performances with Debussy, Ravel, and other Impressionist composers. So that'll be a really fun way to translate this to an online thing in a condition where it is not great to be able to bring a bunch of people into the museum. So it should be fun if you want to tune in. Um, we don't have any rentals in January. We do have some rentals um, into the spring and in some rental inquiries into the spring and then into um, the summer. So I do think that what we're seeing some uh, movement in terms of people's um, willingness to be able to rent the space. Um, so I do expect that to kind of pick up as we start to see the um, vaccines roll out and that sort of thing. Um, let's see, we do have our Friday afternoon concerts that are coming back in February, March, and April. Um, Thursday nights at the museum will um, be vir virtual and that's gonna be 14 different free programs. Again, Eve, as you um, noted. We also have a, um, a new program that we're launching, which is called the Big Picture Climate Change Series. And that is co-presented with the city's Climate Action Task Force along with KGNU, the Longmont leader, and the sustainable, resilient Longmont. Um, and so that's going to be a, basically a lecture series. But for this season, it's going to focus on um, earth, fire, water, wind. What's the other one? Wind? Air, air. There you go. Um, so that's going to be kind of a nice thematic draw. We also have on April the 24th, um, the Earth Day celebration that's gonna be also with Sustainable Resilient Longmont. And then the next section there with the visitor services department, um, we were able to reopen on um, December the 15th. Um, and we had 39 visitors during the um, 12 days um, that we were open in December. I think we've talked about this before, but we have seen a really big decline in terms of the people who are coming to the museum, even when we do have our doors open. Um, but we've seen that offset a lot by the virtual programming that we've done. And so in total, I think that what we're going to end up seeing is that our attendance, if you will, is going to be right in line with what we've seen in the last couple of years, which is about 60, 65,000 people. Um, and so for 
what we will see in 2020 is that most of those are virtual attendance. Um, but it's it's been great to see that we've still been able to maintain that kind of engagement. Um, the um, book sales have been amazing. So for Eric's book um, about the history of Longmont, which I think that um, you all got a copy of, um, we've seen a strong month, um, both online and in person, and we do have sur curbside um, pickup available. So we sold a total of 736 books um, for the month of December. Um, I, can, I don't know the total, total off the top of my head. Eric, do you? I think it's 736 total since the start of, because we just got the books in mid-November, so. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So um, we also had some grab bags available from the merchandise that we had left over from the Day of the Dead. And that actually was kind of a fun way to be able to um, get rid of uh, the merchandise from, you know, that we wouldn't be able to store otherwise. Um, and so there was also curbside pickup available for those. Um, and then now we're starting to gear up for the Impressionism exhibit. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have some good um, gift shop sales for Impressionism. Um, and then we're working on exactly what that attendance looks like. So with all of this virtual um, programming, um, we've had to sort of re-figure re out how we calculate some of these things. And especially for our SCFD purposes, um, we're trying to capture as much data as we possibly can so that we can report that attendance. Um, and Elizabeth is really the one who who is the guru of all of that reporting and that data collection. So she's been spending a lot of time on that. Um, and then she also has been working with Eric on the historic walks and we'll be offering seven tours this year instead of the usual four. And that's because of the um, 150th anniversary. Um, and then also Longmont Public Media is gonna record at least one of those tours. And then for the Art and Public Places program, we've got um, an intern that is um, helping to complete an interpretive um, uh, walking tour. Um, and this is gonna be kind of in line with some of the other walking tours that we've developed for that online platform. Um, and so Courtney is um, the intern that really put that together. And you know, uh, kudos to her. She now is gonna be moving on to a museum studies graduate program at George Washington. Um, oh, she applied for George Washington and at Syracuse. So it's it's just nice to see. I mean, we host a lot of interns. So um, I think that it's good to see folks to go, that go on to do their graduate work. And then I think um, one of our other interns was a um, industrial design intern, and now she's a museum studies um, uh, student. So, you know, we, we convert some people every once in a while to... <laughs> to our, our field, so that's also very nice. Um, the commission, the AIPP commission is also working on maintenance and identifying missing plaques. And so this has been a project that has um, sort of been delayed maintenance, if you will. And so they are really spending a lot of time um, working on identifying where we need to um, get some missing plaques or, or replace some of those missing plaques and make sure that people know which what work is what they are also working on a strategic plan this year. Um, and so they've been uh, co uh, collaborating with the Colorado Creative Industries to be able to get some of um, resources from them. Um, and then <laughs> sort of the, the thing that always gets pushed off to the back burner, the year in file cleanup, um, we luckily one of the benefits of um, having the, our doors closed um, is that we've been able to transfer um, our front desk staff to be able to help with some of this file maintenance, um, this delayed uh, file maintenance. And so that's been um, one of the sort of silver linings of, of moments when we have had to close our doors. So that's been a, a positive result of, of some of these weird times that we're living through. Any questions? That's the end of the report. I just have one question. Um, it was yeah. my recollection that the, maybe it was Day of the Dead was actually videotaped. And so people could could actually visit online. Are we gonna do that for the impressionists? I mean, I realize we probably want people to come into the building, 
Um, but, you know, some people may still not be comfortable or maybe it's something that's done later on. Is, is that in the works? Because I think that would be nice. Yeah. So I am not going to remember off the top of my head when we started doing this, but I think it was at least two years ago that we contracted with the 360 video videographer and we will continue to do that ongoing. Um, and it just was fortuitous, Eve, that we started doing that before the coronavirus happened. Um, because what that does for us is it gives us a, a sort of 360 degree video of being able to kind of walk through that exhibition space. And so that was one of the first things we launched when the when we had to close our doors is that we could say, come experience one of our exhibitions virtually. And so we have every intention to continue doing that with all of our exhibitions. And the way that we've been doing it is that basically um, we record it, we record that video early in the exhibition, but we don't release that video until towards the end so yeah. that we are able to kind of bait people, if you will. Sure. Well, and it'll be interesting to see. I saw online that the tickets will be timed for right. people who are actually coming in. So I think that will be something new. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. We've really, um, again, this is all Elizabeth because she is the um, database guru. Um, but what we decided is, you know, prior to this exhibition, we didn't really have a need for this. Um, we did, we almost never, I'm going to go so far as to say we never were at a moment where we were going to exceed our capacity in the gallery space. With this exhibit, we think that we will. And so that's why we're implementing the time tickets. And I think that that'll just make things a little bit easier for everybody, including the front desk and our visitors. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for one, bringing that. Sure, I had one other quick question that had to do with, we we're talking about oral histories when we were talking about the digitizing of those videotapes. Is there a place in Longmont or an institution or some where that houses oral histories for Longmont, you know, like Carnegie Library in Boulder does. Is there something similar in Longmont? It seems like there are a lot of people whose oral histories would be really great to get um, before those people go away. Dale, well, go ahead. We, the, the Historical Society did um, an oral history program. I'm not, it's been a long time since I was there, so I'm not sure that it's ongoing, but didn't we give those to the museum, Eric? No, they're, they're still at the Historical Society. I used some of them in my book, um, but uh, yeah, the, the actual tapes and- They've been transcribed, um, but of course, this is all 1980s technology or it was in the 80s and 90s, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm starting to explore, because as, as Kim mentioned, the, um, you know, the, there's a lot of challenges with the digital preservation and so forth. And because the Library of Congress has this great StoryCorps program that is really well known, um, I, I'm hoping basically we can kind of ride that train rather than reinventing the wheel where we can work with the StoryCorps app and so forth and just have them tagged as Longmont. And then, then they're available to anybody anywhere um, rather than being you know, locked up in Longmont. So um, I haven't gotten too far with that. I uh, explored a, a little bit with the library. Um, they had a initiative called Strongmont Stories um, early in the pandemic um, to try and get people to do that. And I think it's going to take a little more pushing than, than um, uh, just, just putting it out there. Uh, but that's, that's my hope anyway. And, and Eve, I know um, mm, I'm going to lose track of time here, but probably two years ago at the Day of the Dead um, celebration, uh, KGNU set up a booth at the museum. Um, where they were collecting oral histories. So I think that they probably have um, a repository of some kind. 
Um, I don't know the scope of it, but uh, that event, they were definitely trying to understand better um, some uh, Latinx stories of Longmont. Yeah, it's cool. I just, it's just one of those things where it, some of that information is just fascinating, but having it spread all over the place makes it difficult to, uh, to um, you know, see it. Or, I mean, with what you're doing, Eric, I mean, that's perfect if it's going to be something that will then be available like anywhere, but it sounds like some of it's been collected, but nobody's exactly sure where it is. Yeah, it's an ongoing challenge, definitely, yeah. to work with on this piece. Okay, cool. Um, I do not have a, a report, and I don't think we have any old business. Is there any new business, something that someone would like to bring up? Okay. Um, would someone like to, to make a motion to uh, end the meeting? <laughs> I move to end the meeting. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. I second. Thank you, Dale. And I also saw you were ready to go too, Tom. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please wave your hands. Anybody opposed? Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming to the meeting. 516, we are adjourned. Thank you all and we'll see you next month. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. It's good Thank to you. see you. Bye. Thank you. Good night.